Thank you. All right. Um, I'm excited to be here. Thank you very much for inviting us and uh, letting us set up a booth here. Um, can we get that presentation on? Awesome. So yeah, we are trying to create a zero waste packaging system. Um, along with companies like Loop over there with TerraCycle, uh, we are creating um, a network of reusable packaging. And today, I'll describe a little bit about how it's relevant to you. Um, next slide. So um, the way that we do it in our company is we've got three basic models. The open city, which means you can go anywhere and um, you can borrow packaging and you can return packaging. And then more relevant to your industry is serve on site and prepackaged. Uh, our serve on site, next slide. Our serve on site option is <laughs> basically the way it works is we drop off plates and cutlery, there we go, and cups at your event. Uh, we give it to your vendors, and then they serve that. And next slide. Uh, then at the end of that event, we pick that up. Oh, excellent. No, that's OK. Perfect. Thank you so much. Great. Yes, we pick that up, and uh, we wash it. Um, we have a wash facility here in Toronto where uh, it's an elite certified building. We use Bullfrog Power. And um, we actually use bike more often than we use van uh, when we can. Uh, so then, uh, yeah, then we reuse that again. Um, we drop off everything that you need, return bins, and um, all of the plates and cutlery and so on that you would need at your event. And uh, we work with some big partners, lots of small partners. Um, the most we've served in one day is 16,000 items. Pretty amazing. If you think about all of that could have filled out a big bin. Um, and then the other way that we do it with events is we have prepackaged catering options. So we work with caterers. So today you're getting your lunch in a container like this through Vert Catering. And um, then you basically uh, the, the caterer fills that container, brings it to the event, it's served, and then we collect it and wash it, or they collect it and wash it. And then our open city model, which I'll explain over there if you're interested, is again, basically, you go into a cafe, you scan out a cup, you, you ask for a reusable cup, you scan out a cup, it's yours for free for up to 30 days. Return to over 50 locations here in Toronto. Uh, we also have a couple hundred in Singapore and Hong Kong, which I know are also part of David's project. And, um, and uh, yeah, return anywhere. <laughs> uh, we're actually just about to start a project in Banff, Alberta, where we are creating the very first municipal reuse system, so a lot like how you would have a municipal recycling system, the very first municipal reuse system is happening in Canada. Really exciting. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah. And there we go. Come on down and talk to me after you've had a coffee um, or this afternoon after you've had your lunch, and I'll be happy to explain a little bit more on how it works. Thanks so much. Welcome back, everybody, to uh, SPF 23 Toronto. Hope you had a really good lunch and good opportunity to do some, some networking. To those who have registered for the carbon calculation workshop, it's about to start. So please feel free to head out to conference room B, which is out here 
uh, to my right. And for there, we'll be talking in there about a number of things, including clean tech. So speaking of clean tech, did you know that SPF 23 is bullfrog powered with 100% green electricity? Yeah. So that means that bullfrog powers generators put 100% green electricity into the grid to match the amount of conventional electricity that the event is using, displacing energy from polluting sources. And across Canada, bullfrog's green electricity comes from a blend of wind, solar, and low impact hydropower sourced from new Canadian renewable energy facilities. All right. So for those of you who are out here, uh, we've got a series of speakers who are going to do what we call kind of idea blast. So they're going to kind of wow you with uh, some short presentations and ideas and work that they're doing. So for today's first ideas boost, I'm excited to welcome our first guest speaker, Ian Garrett, director for, uh, of the Center for Sustainable Practice in the Arts. Yeah, yeah. There's a clicker here if you need it. Yes. Hopefully there's, there's slides. Were there, there, were, there were some slides. Yep, some we'll find out. Yep. We can, there we go. All right, hi. Uh, my name's Ian Garrett. I'm director for the Center for Sustainable Practice in the Arts. Uh, we primarily work on uh, live arts and exhibition space, but crossover into recorded media, film, television. Uh, I like the joke that, um, my own background, I grew up in Los Angeles in a film family, and I'm the person who decided not to continue with that, so I am the, uh, I, uh, I speak film and screens with it. So I just wanted to share some of the things that we do at the CSPA. Uh, we've been around since about 2008. Uh, right now, our biggest area of uh, work, and I'll get to that in just a moment, is around, uh, coincidentally, around environmental footprinting using a platform called Creative Green Tools Canada. So uh, we do a lot of publications. Uh, we link a lot of artists. We've been spending the last decade and a half linking artists topically about different different uh, ideas who are working either uh, themselves in a sustainable way, like Afra Shesma, who is a, a visual artist working with ocean waste plastic. Uh, we work with a lot of different festivals. I was just talking during lunch about the Guelph Festival and a three-year project we did, or the Hillside Festival in Guelph, that we did a three-year project that led to their carbon neutrality. Uh, and then we put out a, a quarterly publication, just trying to get uh, the, those who are creating and those who are making uh, to work together, because that's the two areas that we find the greatest amount of resistance uh, when uh, someone is looking at sustainable change. How is it going to change what I make, and how is it going to change how I make it? Is another one. Let's go. There we go. Uh, we also co-run a project called the Climate Change Theater Action, which commissions 50 original short climate change plays every other year. Our festival just started. Uh, this is just actually ones from this weekend, because we actually just launched this year's festival a week ago. Uh, but we think it's really important. It was mentioned in the session right before lunch, or the session before that, about uh, the need for the storytelling side of things. So with the call that there were not enough plays, not enough scripts, not enough people people writing about climate change, uh, we have now commissioned 250 of them uh, that people can then use freely. They're used all over the world. There's been a performance on every continent for it. Uh, so if you go to climatechangetheateraction.com, you can either see an event that's happening nearby, somewhere in the world, or sign up to add to that as well. Uh, we do a lot of... Uh, hopefully that's not me. Um, I have a background in theater tech too, so I'm like keeping my ear open for feedback. Uh, our other projects are around uh, uh, cli uh, climate literacy within arts and cultures. We're running a project right now called the Department of Utopian Arts and Letters, commissioning artists to imagine thriving futures on the other side of climate because we were sick of negative narratives. Uh, and we do residential programs based on this thing called the uh, Creative Climate Leadership Program to do collective uh, 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 week-long resident training programs. Uh, us and many other people here, you've heard many tools I've already heard spoken about today. There's some happening in the other room as well. Um, 
we convene a group uh, that has no name. It is an ad hoc group of people who make tools and guides from around the world. Uh, some of them are here. Uh, key cultures, there's stuff in exhibition space. Uh, there's more on the practitioner side, the sustainable production cool, uh, toolkit for theater. The theater green book in the UK has been taken off for facilities, et cetera. And uh, all of us get together every six weeks to talk about what we could do better uh, and to see what everybody else is doing to try and partner together with the idea uh, that uh, we're cataloging these tools and we just want people to use something. Nobody in this arena has a horse in the race that they are going to have their best tool. We've all just been doing it and seeing things come and go. We want people to use things. Um, we see it as a bit of a Trojan horse. If we can get you to start calculating, analyzing what you're doing, then we can have bigger and more exciting conversations about the world. Our own tool is called the Creative Green Tools Canada. It's based off of a tool out of the UK um, by an organization called Julie's Bicycle. Uh, it allows uh, tours, uh, facilities, uh, exhibition spaces, we're adding in commercial music protection, and we're looking at expanding it uh, with more tools for publishing and the distribution of physical media where that still exists, uh, for putting things out there, becomes a tool that's uh, geared specifically towards creative pro uh, professionals. In the UK, it's led to a 40% decrease uh, in the funded sector's carbon footprint. Uh, right now, we're working with Canada Council to get it out there. Um, it's being worked into, if you're working in the live event space and you're working in Quebec, uh, our Montreal, both Calc and CAM, are integrating it into their reporting infrastructure. CADA is starting to do that. It's a coalition of council funding, arts council funding primarily. Uh, so here, uh, TAC, OAC, uh, looking at integrating this as well so that we can get to a national benchmark. It's completely free to the users, uh, including uh, hands-on customer support and training for it. Uh, and uh, is delivered completely bilingual. We have a, a f dedicated French team of support as well and co-deliver it uh, with the Council Québécois Evetement uh, Eco Responsable, uh, also built in Montreal. Uh, so hopefully, um, one of those things is useful to you, and if you want to talk about how those could be integrated into what you're doing um, or adapted otherwise, I'm, I'll be around all day. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. You're not related to Peter Garrett, singer of Midnight Oil, are you? No. no? Well, you're both, both sustainability insp inspirationalists, so thank you for what you're doing. And it's great to see the cross-pollination collective action that we've been talking about in terms of like working with Julie's Bicycle to inspire and, and develop a, a Canada-specific tool, a suite of tools, and, and that's, that's, just, that's what it's all about, right? Like, learn with what, with, with, from what other people are doing, build on it, and and uh, and keep getting the word out. So next, we have Laura Noxon, who is the product development manager of Scriptation. Welcome to the stage. Thank you very much. I'm bringing my notes because I don't do this very often. Uh, so yeah, I am a product manager at Scriptation. If you haven't heard of Scriptation. Uh, you are about to. If you have heard about Scriptation, I really want to nerd out with you about this app because it is really, really cool. Uh, it is, we are a PDF annotation app for filmmakers. It was built by filmmakers. Uh, I spent a long time on set both as a producer as well as in writer's rooms as a script coordinator, and one of the biggest frustrations that I saw was just the amount of paper waste. Uh, when you get a new version of that script, you print out a whole new draft. Is that the button? That is the button. So you, so you can break down your script within the app, and then when you get a new version of the script, we have a, an Emmy award-winning transfer function that will move all of your notes from one version of a script to the next. Uh, because, <laughs> if you haven't noticed, people love paper, and it is really, really difficult to get people to change their way of working or whatever habits they already have in place without, for just environmental reasons. And so this transfer algorithm has convinced people that there is also a more efficient way of working. And that's how we were convincing people to move away from paper and onto iPads. Uh, <laughs> and uh, whoop, let me see. Which has led to paperless production. That is our main goal with, uh, with Scriptation. We are really in, worried about the climate, obviously. Uh, and paperless production is one of our core commitments as well as becoming one of the studio's huge commitments as well. And so 
Uh, we have estimated that with our transfer algorithm, we have saved over 350,000 scripts from being printed, uh, which comes out to all of these fun stats up here but that I won't go through. But uh, it's really cool having data about these things uh, with, with what, we, what we're doing. Uh, and we also have a whole bunch of other cool features for filmmakers, such as layers. So layers is a, uh, it's kind of like Photoshop layers, but for all of your notes to organize yourself. It was, uh, it, the idea came from a director who wanted to give his annotated script to his actors, but didn't want to actually show his actors all of his notes. So you, this is also a great way of collaborating where uh, you could just send one layer of notes to other people. So instead of printing out a whole script for every single department, you can actually just send a layer of notes and put it into your own script. And then we've got an automatic actor highlighting, so we can stop printing out those full scripts at, at table reads. You can actually just have a couple backup standby iPads, and you can instantly highlight somebody's lines, because a lot of actors come with their own scripts, or they're already on scriptation, so they, you don't need to have a script made up for every single person. And then we've, oop, wrong, wrong device. Uh, and of course, backing up to the cloud. So that's one thing that you can't do with paper. If you had your entire production binder with all of your notes and all of your uh, everything, your storyboards, your set location notes and whatnot, um, you can have it all within scriptation and then it just backs up to the cloud. And something that I'm very excited about is um, being able to actually get metadata out from the script and onto whatever your, your workflow is. So we have tagging where you can use a, the highlighter tool and have different, uh, different colors for each of your different categories. And then that can be exported into a CSV, so you don't need that final draft file at all. You can just do this all straight from the PDF. And yeah, we're used all over the place. Uh, studios love us because we, we don't actually keep any user data. We don't make you make accounts. We don't keep any of your information. All of the backups are done to other people who do that for their living, so Dropbox and iCloud and whatnot. Uh, and we have a whole bunch of deals with studios too, so if you are an independent filmmaker, find out for it with your production if you already have a deal set in place with them. Uh, and yeah, if you would like, it is available for download. It's actually a free app, I uh, forgot to mention that earlier, for any uh, Apple device. And if you download with that QR code, we are doing a free month of our pro features. So things like the actor highlight and the uh, layers and transfer, all of that is for free. We're just trying to help Hollywood go paperless, but things like the tagging and those like backups to the cloud, that's part of our industry pro subscription, which for Canadians is $100 a year. It's not too bad. But again, talk to your productions because we may already have a deal with you guys. We're talk to your unions as well. We're, we're trying to just get the word out there. And yeah, if you have any questions, I am over at that table. I have a whole bunch of merch and you can spin to win and a whole bunch of fun things. So come and visit me and nerd out about this cool app. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Laura. I agree, having data at your fingertips is awesome because it lets you inspire, learn, and even if it's imperfect data, it's usually something that can be indicative and that you can take action on it. So, um, And it's great to go paperless. So next up, we have um, Anika Grieve, who's the Senior Director of Business Development at TerraCycle. Welcome. Which green on the, the play or the? I think it's the play. Technology is not my strong point, so bear with me. I also did just have a cold last week, so if I start coughing or not COVID, um, this is my disclaimer in case this is a terrible presentation. I have a reason for it. Um, but I'm Annika. I head up our business development team for TerraCycle and Loop, which is the reuse division of TerraCycle. Um, TerraCycle is a social enterprise. What that means is that we're a for-profit business, but driven by a mission. And our mission is to eliminate the idea of waste. And that really drives anything and everything that we do. I'll talk a little bit about some of our major business units in a minute, but mainly it goes from recycling, the unrecyclable, I'll talk about what that means later, um, incorporating new recycled content back into new packaging and products, uh, reusing first, like Muse over there, um, and then cleaning up waste wherever we can, but really finding new value in what other people see as garbage. Let's see if this works. That was the wrong one. That was the right one. So TerraCycle has been around for about 20 years. 
Um, we are headquartered in Trenton, New Jersey, but our Canadian head office is just in Toronto. We're up at Oakwood Village. Come check us out there. It is a very cool space and a very cool neighborhood. Um, and we are active in 21 countries. So you can kind of see here, there's a lot of colors going on, but mainly throughout North America, down into Brazil, um, and throughout Europe and Asia and into Australia as well. Um, basically, we're global because our partners are also global, but also very local. Uh, our approach really stems from moving from a linear economy, which you've heard about a lot today, and moving it into a circular economy. What that means is moving from take, make, waste into take, but make, and then remake, and remake, and remake until it continues through the cycle. So using what you can in its current form for as long as possible, but then ultimately breaking it down once it hits its end of life. Everything does have an end of life. It's just a matter of how long you can prolong it, and then building it into something new again so it can start a new life. So, recycling, the first and foremost and the biggest, and there's a lot of contention about it right now, which I think is fantastic, because you should talk about it, you should know about it, you should hear about it. Recycling and what makes something recyclable, very different things. From a technical standpoint, everything can be recycled. For the caveats out there, 99.9% .9 of things can probably be recycled. It is a matter of what's practically done, and that ultimately comes down to economics. You see here kind of a fancy equation, but it's basically if a processor, so a MRF, a material recycling facility, Waceco, GFL, you see their green trucks around here, they need to be able to pay for the cost of collection from your doorstep, from your wherever it may be, the processing of it, and turning it into something new. And that has to cost less than for what they can sell it, which I think Rethink was up here earlier. It doesn't happen in a lot of cases, which is the unfortunate part. So what we do at TerraCycle is we try to fix this equation by working with individuals, with community organizations, with production sets, um, with businesses, with retailers, like your Walmarts out in the world, and uh, with brands like your Nestle's and Coca-Cola's to be able to fund the cost of the collection and processing and ultimately make sure that it then gets turned into something new. So our first and biggest division is recycling. Here we're talking about anything and everything that doesn't go through your municipal waste stream. Our founder CEO will be the first to say, we don't want to be in existence. So we hope and we're trying to build a future where we don't need to exist, where there is a very efficient municipal system that works for everything. But here, think about things that don't go through your blue bin. So your beauty packaging, your mascara, your lipstick, your skincare. We're working with partners like Nordstrom or Walmart to be able to, you can go as a consumer, drop off your empties, they can be, you know, still product in them, um, drop them off, we collect them, and we make sure they get processed into something new. All the way to waste streams you might never think of, your contact lenses and the blister packs that go with the contact lenses. So if you are a contact lens wearer, check out some of your optician offices or our website. Bausch & Lomb has a fantastic program here in Canada that recycles your contact lenses. Um, all the way to events. This is great for things like your sets. Um, anything from your cups to your coffee pods, to your snack wrappers, to your cigarette butts for the, the smokers out there as well. Uh, a cool example of what this product gets turned into is something like this. So these are actually the, po the podiums that were used in the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo. These are all made by TerraCycle in partnership with P&G. For a few years running up to the Olympics, we worked with households to collect laundry containers and other household waste items from households in, uh, in Japan, and they were turned into the podiums that were used in the Olympics. It's kind of a cool story. Those will then get dismantled and used and put into something else. So I think these are applications that you could also look at for your sets. Can you take down your sets, just basically reduce them, and then put them back into com new components? Next, we have new unique waste streams. So recycled content is a huge thing, and it should be more of a thing, because you can't recycle it if nobody's gonna use it on the end of it. A lot of that comes from water bottles. It's nice, clear, clean PET. It functions almost as new, uh, as kind of new virgin material does. But oftentimes that get, does, gets diverted into things which we actually kind of call downcycling. So into clothing or into uh, other kinds of furniture or textiles, things that can't necessarily be recycled back again easily into something new. So we work to collect unique waste streams and put them back into new packages and product. This is a great example. The picture came out a little blurry, sorry. But this is the head and shoulders bottle, um, which was one of the first to launch with ocean plastic in it. So this has, I think, about 25% ocean plastic launched in 2017. It was one of the first in the world, which is really exciting. 
um, but think all the way from steel oxygen tanks that go into pristine watches, which is kind of a cool waste stream and one that we are working on, which is pretty interesting. Finally, what we know is that recycling is critical and necessary, but it is not the end all. Like our partners over there with Muse, you need to be able to reuse something first, keep it in its current form. Reuse is always better than recycling. Reuse it until you possibly can't anymore, and then ultimately recycle it. So loop is our reuse function. Sadly, not right now in Canada, but we are live in the US, France, and Japan, where it's essentially, for those Ontarians here, the beer store model, but elevated to everything. Um, so you get all of your favorite products on a deposit paste pre-fill ecosystem. So you pay a small deposit along with your ketchup or your beverage, you use it at home, and when you bring it back, you get your deposit back. We take it, we clean it, we send it back to the manufacturers, whether it's Kraft Heinz or Nestle or Coca-Cola, and they refill and start the process again. Just some examples of what those products look like and stores that we're currently live in today and starting to expand with Nationwide, both in France and Japan, which is pretty awesome. So talk to Loblaws for us and Sobeys, and <laughs> we'll come to Canada soon, I hope. Um, and finally, we're also working in areas where there is no infrastructure right now for uh, recycling and collection, unfortunately. Um, so we're working with local community organizations right now in Thailand, in Bangkok, um, to clean up river waste and with other community organizations there, not only to clean up from the rivers, and we have, I, I don't know what the actual tonnage is right now, but it's been pretty impressive in the last two years that we've been there, but also create the infrastructure and educate with our, our consumers there. So working with partners like the Coca-Cola Foundation to be able to fund this process as well, which is pretty important. That's it. I hope I kept my five minutes, maybe. <laughs> but if you want to talk trash, come see us. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. That was awesome. Thank you very much. And I think another thing that yeah, TerraCycle does that wasn't mentioned today and that is important for a certain sector of the film industry is cigarette butts, right? Cigarette butts. So they will definitely collect and recycle cigarette butts. So, so thank you to TerraCycle for that. Uh, okay, so for the, the last little um, ID boost for this segment, we've got uh, Ben Mercier from Driving Force. He's the Director of Business Development for Driving Force. Welcome, Ben. Thank you, and it's the little uh, green button uh, arrow there. Okay, perfect. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for everyone for putting on the event here. When I first got asked about coming, I thought the SPF was for sunscreen, but apparently I got that wrong. So. Um, Okay, I want to talk to you a little bit about Driving Force and what we're doing in kind of the transportation sector um, as it relates to uh, film and productions. So um, if you don't know much about Driving Force, it wouldn't surprise me, um, but we're in the, as I said, in the transportation industry. We um, have about 15,000 vehicles across Canada, mostly out west, but we've been, and that's about 45 years, but we've been out east here for around five years now, so we're just... Uh, kind of getting more well-known here. And we'll see if I can get this to... Yeah, okay, there we go. Okay, I wanted to start off with this slide here because one of the things that I've discovered specifically with trying to get electric vehicles out into the marketplace is that it really does take partners in a bunch of different areas. This is a challenging kind of new, new frontier for, for everyone. So, um, over in the West, which is where I'm at in, in Vancouver, um, we've got great support from Creative BC and Real Green, which is um, part of Creative BC where they really work to push sustainability in film. Um, Netflix has also been a fantastic partner out there. They have um, a sustainability team that has been really, really active in helping us get electric vehicles on the road. And again, working with not just on the electric vehicle side, but with um, other related industries to, to get their productions greener. And then lastly, uh, Warner Brothers uh, Discovery. So again, the reason for that is, is it, this really takes a collaborative effort. Um, we rent electric vehicles, but there's a lot more that goes into actually getting those vehicles on the road. Charging infrastructure being one of those huge components. So this is a little look at some of our lineup. We have a couple of vehicles here today, as been, has been mentioned a couple of times. We have the uh, middle vehicle there, the all-electric cargo van, that's a Ford E-Transit. And then over on the right, that's a half-ton truck, the Ford uh, Lightning. 
And then over on the left, um, this is something which I think is unique to Driving Force. Um, I don't know if there's another rental car, rental vehicle company out there that has an all electric quite this size. So we've got 10 of these on fleet. It's a 24, 26 foot box. So this can work on uh, production sets as well. So um, this just gives you an idea all the way from cast and crew vehicles up to the type of vehicles that are used in, in doing sets and whatnot. Okay, so one of the big, big challenges for us has been with charging infrastructure. So we have a fairly decent infrastructure in BC right now in terms of public charging. Um, I'm not sure how Ontario matches up with that, but regardless, it's a challenge as soon as you get away from any sort of public support. And, and frankly, when you get to bigger vehicles, waiting for an hour or two at a public charging uh, station just isn't super, uh, it's not super practical. So the couple of areas that we're really looking for support from is, is number one from studios. Um, where studios can put in level two, level three charging to help make sure that, again, this, this transportation side of the business where we're able to put more electric vehicles out into the market. So studios is a high priority, and um, we've done some work and some, we're in discussions with some studios now that are, are starting to make at least level two charging more of a priority, which is great. The other factor is charging away from the studio. So doing location shoots and that sort of thing. So again, it's a lot of diff different people in the industry trying to figure this out. So um, here's a couple solutions I just wanted to give a, a quick look at. The one on the far right um, is a level two mobile charging solution. So you can kind of see down at the bottom those uh, leads there connect into the, um, into the generators on site. So you can plug in that level two and then you can charge your electric vehicle. Um, for vehicles that require a higher level of charging, um, this is one of a couple different solutions that we're toying around with right now. This is another mobile charger. It actually stores the power in the charger itself, so you, you charge the whole unit, and uh, they make it in up to a 300 kilowatt configuration, which is a fair amount of power. Um, you store that power and then you can, again, you can charge your vehicle um, on location. So there's some more solutions like this that people are working through right now. Cost is a big factor. These are not cheap. Um, so for as much um, you know, support as there is out there in terms of rebates and incentives to purchase electric vehicles, again, this is another area where this industry needs some help with actually reducing the cost, the upfront cost on the charging solutions, because it's, again, it's, it's not cheap. It's a very, very sizable investment. It's a close-up, apparently, of our all-electric. And this is by a company called Lion Electric, which is uh, out of uh, Quebec. OK, so apparently, I have a video. Since we're doing Green. film here, I guess we're going to go ahead and we're going to play just a short video. Green. Commercial transportation. We help keep your business moving forward with a reduced maintenance, a proven safety record, and a cleaner, more efficient journey for your fleet. At Driving Force, we help ensure deliveries are dependable with the Ford E-Transit. Enjoy a quiet ride that gets your cargo where it needs to go without worry and without emissions. Join the electric revolution with Ford's F-150 Lightning, delivering a world of EV technology in this epic truck series. Connect with us today for electric vehicle solutions matched with superior service. Okay. Electrify your thing. Thanks, so if there's anyone out there who wants to learn more, we do have a table over there. Be happy to talk to you about electric vehicles and how we can work with the film industry. Thanks very much, Ben. That's great. Yeah. Uh, Driving Force has been a key partner out in Vancouver for a number of years in terms of helping the industry transition away from uh, fossil fuel burning vehicles. So we've got about 30 minutes left. At about 2 o'clock, I'll be coming back to uh, doing the next series of, I, uh, of ID Boost. But in the meantime, that means you guys have got 30 minutes to play uh, on my 
right here, we've got Andy Hutton, who is the head of products, batteries, and mobile power for Anton Bauer, as well as Mike Harwood, who is the national director of technical support and, Deve and development at William F. White's. And they've got some clean technology here, some battery power uh, options that you can come and ask questions. Maybe they'll even let you play with it, push some buttons, and see how it all works. But you've got uh, you've got a opportunity here to just kind of do a bit of a deep dive and hands-on experimenting. So enjoy, and I'll be back in about half an hour. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Andrew Robinson from GreenSpark Group, and super happy to be here today and see all these, uh, all this, hear all this amazing content. And we are going to hear a lot of more amazing ideas. So during the following idea boost, um, our next speaker is going to present, and for the first time, CBC's carbon calculator data. So please welcome Lisa Clarkson, Executive Director of Business and Rights and Production Sustainability for CBC. Thanks, Andrew. Is this the, yeah? I have to say, especially because it's a smaller crowd, I'm sort of slightly tempted. I don't know what that bike does, but I want to get on it and then sort of give my remarks circling around. I think it looks pretty cool. So whoever's bike that is, I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Um, I don't know where the horn section is, but I feel like, doo -doo -doo, I feel like there needs to be a bit of a pomp and ceremony around uh, CBC's first ever release, <laughs> excellent, <laughs> um, first ever release of our carbon calculator data for productions. And what that is, is that is the data for our in-house productions and also uh, the projections that we support um, through our independent production partners, some of whom are here today. And so, um, Let's see. Um, this story, I feel like there's a story. There's a lot of art here. Um, but uh, this story starts uh, back in June of 2021 when CBC launched its uh, environmental strategy through the help and partnership of GreenSpark. And that was called Greening Our Story. It's online. And in it, you will see targets that we set ourselves for um, carbon calculations on our productions, both uh, internal and external. Um, we chose the Albert uh, carbon calculator for a number of reasons. Um, we chose it because we wanted one tool that we could uh, help and support the industry to use. We chose it because um, a number of our provincial uh, partners were supporting that uh, tool. We chose it because it was released in the UK in uh, 2011, and uh, the UK broadcasters and then Netflix had been using it uh, for some time. And for this purpose, we chose it because it allows you to aggregate the data and we wanted an aggregate data picture to understand a little bit about what was happening with uh, the carbon uh, when it came to uh, original productions in Canada. This is sort of what it looks like. Um, it will be available in text format in the coming weeks. Um, I think there's so many great ideas here that while we will release this iteration as at September 8th, uh, we will also um, have a section where we update as we go along because this is the first wave. Uh, we made um, carbon calculation a mandatory requirement for independent productions across the board in January of 2023 for uh, entertainment, factual, and sports internal productions in October of 2022. So we're just starting to see these waves of calculators because, of course, they're delivered when the production is complete. 
Um, so that's what it looks like, and she's in the other room. She's delivering a carbon calculation uh, workshop, but I do want to shout out to Leticia Cagua, who is the author of the report. She put together the data um, with a tool that we developed. She's just absolutely incredible. I encourage you to... Oh, my God, she's right here. Leticia, as if on cue. This is Leticia. Um, she is the author of the report, and she's just incredible. I encourage you to, to uh, chat to her at the cocktail party. Um, so what's our data set? Our data set is 64, um, the data from 64 productions. I think it is the uh, largest uh, carbon calculator data set yet released in Canada to date. It's in-house and independent. It's CBC English language only. And uh, what are the results that we wanted to tell you about? From those, keep in, keep in your heads, because this is important, 64 productions, 64. Um, those 64 productions emitted uh, close to 10,000 um, uh, tons of carbon dioxide, and per hour, it, the picture looks like about 36.1 um, tons an hour. But if you're like me, <laughs> I have no idea what that means. It looks like. Is it big? Is it not? I don't know. Um, so put another way, if you think of households, that equates to energy use, wait for it, for a full year um, in 2,227 households. That's just from 64 um, productions. Um, and uh, I transpose that ratio onto uh, CMF's uh, original productions, which is about 834 in the last fiscal year, and that equates to energy use for households in Labrador, PEI, and Newfoundland. And that's CMF is part of the picture too. Um, there are other many other productions that don't use um, CMF funds, so you can imagine what that total number looks like. So we do have a uh, challenge slash opportunity. Um, what filming activities contribute most to emissions? Um, uh, travel and transport was uh, the number one source according to our data. It's about 43% of that total and again converted to households, it is uh, 952 uh, households. Um, here, you'll, you'll be able to see this much more readily when you see the text version, but uh, here is the uh, calculator data. Uh, travel and transport is there in the orange. Um, filming spaces in the, in the dark blue, 23%. Um, and materials is in the pink at 22%. So those are the big three. Those are the big three. Um, if you look at travel and transport, the biggest of the two is road transport. Um, so when you think about you know, your vehicles and how you get materials and equipment and people to and from sets, that's really the biggest emitter slash area of opportunity. Um, just before, um, well, what genre contributes to the most uh, emissions? Uh, this shouldn't be a surprise. It is drama, um, followed by uh, comedy, kids, and then uh, entertainment programming. What I was going to say is that when you think of those top three areas of emissions, um, something that Andrew said actually uh, just earlier is that sometimes you get indications that are consistent with other data sets. Well, the fact is that those top three areas are also the top three for the UK Albert uh, data and for SPA in the US. So we're pretty confident that those are the area of opportunity. So that brings us to the fun part. What can we do with all this information? Um, there have been lots of incredible ideas here. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of the suggestions. I just don't have the time for it. But you'll see uh, that in the report, we've broken down, Letitia's broken down the suggestions by those top three areas. And um, 
using carbon-free travel options, really thinking about where your locations are, are they together, how do people get between, uh, trialing different things and at Radio Canada, um, some of our journalists in Montreal are on electric scooters, it's really trying to think through uh, what are, are all of the ways um, that we can change this picture? Um, filming spaces. Uh, David Miller talked about those incredible um, cities that were in his group of 40, some of which are Canadian, looking into what they offer to um, uh, plug in and have electricity sources that don't create uh, such admissions. And uh, materials, reuse. Um, is an obvious one, recycled materials. We've heard from a lot of people who are building businesses around that. And I just say, you know, the plant-based meals thing has been around for a while, but uh, just on Saturday, I went to something called Vegandale. And just in case you think it's on the fringes, I'm not kidding you, number one, there are probably about, I don't know, between five and 10,000 people there, it was packed and also about 60 um, vendors that were selling vegan foods. So there's so much choice now um, in terms of plant-based meals, um, and it's just getting better by the day. Uh, and then uh, Elisa spoke about this, thinking about what you want to do, how you want to do it um, in advance, whether or not sustainability plans, we've got a sustainable checklist. Um, and then, so finally, um, well now what? Um, there's really three things that we're focused on. Continuing to collect the data so that we have a baseline and so that we know that we can do better. We commit to releasing data intermittently to the industry. So that's the first thing. The second is action, action, action. Uh, really coming up with some solid actions that fit and address those three areas that uh, we have identified are the biggest cause of um, carbon emissions. And the third is, uh, boy, we've got to avoid duplication. So it is um, ebullient collaboration uh, with others. Um, that's, that's really starting. There are lots of groups that are popping up, but really aggressively collaborate with one another. Every second you spend duplicating is a wasted minute. Um, so um, collaborating. And so I think that, that just to conclude, let's make this the year of action. I think together that we can uh, be bold, we can be brilliant, and we can be brazen. And I can't wait to report on that next year. Thanks. Thank you so much, Lisa, Leticia, and CBC. Uh, for a year of action, having data like that and this report coming out is instrumental. It's, it's so useful to start conversations and to, uh, to allow us to lean into uh, the focus areas that, that require the most amount of collaboration. So thank you very much. Looking forward to that report coming out. Next up, we've got David Oyle, who is the uh, Senior Advisor for Strategic Communication. Welcome to the stage for CBC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. And hello, everyone. Pretty good day so far. It's very interesting. So I'm here to talk about, I guess we'll get the slides to come up. I'm going to talk about Oscar. I'm going to talk about a, uh, an AI resident of the Toronto Broadcast Centre. If you haven't explored yet, uh, it's just down the hallway leading to John Street. And uh, I'll be introducing him in just a moment. But it's, I'm basically here today, uh, basically on behalf of my uh, colleague, Amanda Stesky. She's with uh, Technology and Infrastructures uh, based in Vancouver. She's kind of the, uh, the keeper of Oscar, if you will, uh, or the lead of that particular program here that I'll explain. And she was kind enough to help me and prepare some slides. So I'm presenting this on her behalf, um, but also just to share how we've been using this to help uh, with our uh, waste diversion program. So as you've probably recalled seeing from um, Anik's procurement presentation earlier today. We've got a number of um, targets and, uh, and goals with regards to our strategy, uh, greening our story. One of them that uh, centers in on what I'm talking about is our waste and recycling, which is basically working towards a zero waste goal. 
and, uh, and a 75% diversion rate. So one of the things to help us get there, because we do have, you know, for many years now, we've had signage around our waste bins, around the buildings, and, and our work locations across the country. But one thing we've just started about the year ago, we introduced Oscar in the Toronto Broadcast Centre, which is basically this AI system that, um, as it says here, it helps you kind of, it tells you how to, to dispose of whatever it is. It's got a little camera that you place your item if you're not sure what it is, and it will actually tell you or take a best guess as to which bin it should go by identifying it. Now, it being an AI, it's something that learns over time, and there's some items it may not completely recognize, uh, but if that's the case, sometimes it'll say, well, if it's this, if it's a cardboard thing, it should go here, if it's that, it should go there. Um, as a bit of a teaser, if anyone wants to go check it out, see what happens when you put your cell phone in front of it and what it tells you to do with it. Um, so just, you know, check that out. And um, anyway, as I'd mentioned, it's about a year ago that we installed Oscar here in Toronto. We've used it in a couple different locations um, throughout the building, sometimes to showcase it in busier parts. But apparently something about it being with an AI-based system is that it has to be in the same surrounding with the same type of lighting and, and traffic and such to remember things so it can suggest as best as possible. So we try not to move it around, although at this point we are looking at maybe putting it into different parts of the building based on some of the learnings that uh, I'll be sharing momentarily. Earlier in March, we also introduced an Oscar unit in the uh, cafeteria of our uh, Maison Radio Canada in Montreal, and it's been really well received there as well. Um, so, reasons to have this, I mean, it's probably not practical to have something like this in every waste station throughout the building, but as I mentioned, it's kind of a, a bit of a novelty, but it's a kind of a cool way to gamify, if you will, what to do with your waste. It helps educate the user, because sometimes people come to these things, a friend of mine was saying the other day, they almost feel like put on the spot when they're like, okay, what bin do I use? This way, Oscar takes that pressure out by, you know, you scan the item and it'll tell you. It should go here, or it's organic, or whatnot. And <clears throat> it also gets you engaged. It gets the person into it. And it can also dispel a bit of that cynicism. Some people are like, ah, it doesn't matter which one. It'll get sorted or goes all to the same place. This reinforces how it's important. We were talking about this morning, how it's important to close the gaps, reduce waste or eliminate waste, and especially as it relates to even compost, things that are organic, we want to put that in the green bin as much as possible. Um, and also, Oscar will help reduce the contamination of waste streams, because even though there's some sorting, it can really help if from the get-go, people get into the habit and, and the right waste does in fact go into the right, the right uh, particular bin. And as a result of using Oscar, there's waste audits that get done or to see how well people are using the system. And then we can also correspond these with other waste audits happening elsewhere in the building. And that, that way we get, some, uh, we get some particular learnings. Now in this case, um, as I mentioned, Oscar is adapting continuously, learning and, and, and kind of getting better at suggesting. It's data driven <clears throat> in that it collects its information and then it kind of in turn helps inform and shape our communications around it, as well as, and I'll give an example at the end, of, of kind of an end result of all this. Because one of the things that was noticed in just the last several months is that napkins in particular are a source of con contamination because it's the thing that, I think there was a stat at one point, according to One Way Side, was like 85% of napkins are thrown into the wrong bin because some people falsely think that it's paper, so it should just go in the paper recycling. Or in some people, people just think, okay, well, whatever, it's got food or whatever on it, I'm just going to put it in the garbage. When in fact, it can go into the organics bin, and that from there, we can do all the good things that we normally do with organics and compost. So, as a result, that's a learning. We can use it to shape our messaging. And then, like in this case, those who go and check out Oscar later, you'll see one of the images there in rotation, in addition to you being able to use it and interact with it, is it will put a reminder that napkins, for instance, go into the organics bin. And this is also a learning that we can use that we're looking now at, again, because Oscar is only at a couple locations, uh, at two of our work sites, that we're looking at doing monitor slides in various meeting rooms and things like that throughout the business, where if you're waiting to have a meeting start, you've got this thing that reminds you that, you know, hey, when it comes time to throwing out some garbage and you've got some napkins, 
uh, napkins in particular or paper towels should be going to the organics because our hope is with that we'll see some some significant improvement with how the waste uh, the waste stream and the diversion gets done so that's about it that's just my quick uh, spiel for the Oscar system do go check it out it's a bit fun and uh, thank you again for your time take care it's right behind the hallway there okay okay John Street I can if you didn't catch that, it's right behind over here to, uh, to catch that. So thank you, David. All right, well, I'm sure you're wondering, what is this prop up here? Is it just for fun? No, it's actually going to be uh, talked about right now. So I'd like to invite Jared Lawrence up from Cycling Cinematographers to tell us what this is all about. Clicker, it's a big. Okay, I don't. Oh, you don't have. I don't know if I don't know if my video made it, but I, I have some examples of video over there, and the story with those is that every one of those was produced with some kind of help from a cargo bike. My name is Jared. I'm a cycling cin cinematographer. I'm a camera op and a producer. I'm here to convince you to embrace the freedom of cycling in your practice. I want to start by saying thank you to our Greenway, to Curbside Cycle, to Whites, to the Design Fabrication Zone at TMU, to BP Solar Punk Media, to Greenspark Group, and to the SPF for letting us come and talk to you like this. So we are soon to be a co-op, and we came about as a resource sharing group. I was interviewing senior DPs, people who had been in the business for 30 years or more, about how they stuck around. And they did certain things. They shared resources with one another, they had a mentorship pipeline, and they had some other source of income. Either they were inventing something, they had a side gig, or they were sitting on a pile of money. So I'm not sitting on a pile of money, and we decided to put some of these best practices into, into practice by sharing resources. And you notice nowhere in there has anybody said you should have a bike. It wasn't, wasn't on the list. But then one day, I was riding to work with Douglas Coe, and he revealed to me that he loved to ride his bicycle to work. And there's, there's not really a higher-end DP than Doug uh, at the time, so I thought maybe we're onto something with these bicycles. So we got early validation from him, from Min Suk Lee, from the National Theater School, and from E1. Our first prototype rode 75,000 kilometers. And I was challenged today to rig up a bike in seven minutes. I need to let you know that I'm in the union. And so in order for me to rig a bike in seven minutes, I require a day of prep and two technicians. <laughs> so the bike came here rigged today. We rode it 50 kilometers without it loosening off. You could lift the bicycle up with this mount, and it's built to take a full-size camera. But really, the true utility in a cargo bike is the fact that you can get from A to B without having to pay for gas or parking. And that's it. Um, if you want to try out a bike, you can line something up with us. We'd be happy to have you try a bicycle out. Um, we can share them. We can come and, and share our expertise with you on set. Yes, a cargo bike is expensive, but it will pay for itself in six to nine months, I guarantee you, if you replace a car. Um, so that, that's it. If you want to follow us, you can find us on Instagram. If I have time left, let's see. Do I have time left? I do. I have 10 things that every cycling cinematographer needs. It's not everything that a cycling cinematographer needs, but it is 10 things you need. One, a kit that includes spare tubes, a pump, lube, multi-wrenches, a change of clothes, tie-downs, and deodorant. Two, rain gear for you and your equipment. Three, a cargo bike or a regular bike with lots of bags and racks. Four, tie downs. Five, insurance. Six, a community. Seven, baby wipes. Eight, to be paid for their work. I told you I'm in the union. And nine, an action camera. 10, a biking lawyer. Notice nowhere on here, spandex, lycra, <laughs> cycling shoes, not even a camera. You just need these 10 things. Thank you very much for your time. I hope that you will try out a cargo bike. I hope that you will integrate bikes into your production, into your production pipeline. No carbon. Thank you.
think biking is also the most efficient means of uh, transportation in terms of converting your leg energy to kinetic forward energy. So that's great. So the next idea boost, I'd like to invite uh, Andy Hutton, who's head of products, batteries and mobile power for Anton Bauer Salty Dog. Thank you very much. It takes a while, doesn't it? It does. It does. That's my steps for the year. Is it this one? Yes. Well, thank you all for inviting me. Uh, I know you've been waiting for this. It's the most important bit of the day. Batteries, power, you name it. Without it, none of this works. So let's see what we've actually got lined up for you. So a little bit about Anton Bound. I do mean a little. We've been around for 53 years now. There we go. Sorry about that. Been around for 53 years now. Uh, we've always been quite innovative. We've been involved in all camera accessories, mounts. We invented the gold mount uh, standard. We did the P-tap. And this is really just the next step along the actual cycle. So before we get into it, I am a battery person, and I will hold my hands up. Batteries are quite bad. You know, lithium, cobalt, how it's mined, refined, the impact it has on the environment, there's no getting away from it. You can't be in this industry and pretend you don't know. We know. We are trying to make it better, though. We've always tried to use premium cells, which then last longer, which then means you're not taking more material out of this system. You're not adding to the problem. We have been trying to become greener and greener and greener. We've always believed that if you buy us, it lasts two times longer than everybody else. So you buy us once instead of someone else two or three times. There's a reason we have a premium. That is the reason. So things have changed. In the last 10 years, ESG didn't really exist. It was something you'd tell shareholders. It would be like, yes, we have an ESG plan. But we don't know what it is. We can't tell you. In the last two or three years, ESG is number one or number two. Nothing happens without it. This wouldn't be happening right now without it. And there wouldn't be this many people who are this involved and passionate with trying to make a change. And this is where we come into it. Everything else in production seems to have got better. But fuel generators, they're still the same. There may be level three, level four, maybe level five. But it's still fuel going in, emissions coming out. So how can we change this? What can we do? And this is where we come into it. We're trying to make a change, which is why I've come up with. It did work. Good timing. The salty dog. So it is over there. This is the first time it's ever been seen. This is the worldwide premiere. So oh, please, carry on. <laughs> so what makes it different? Well, it's made from salt, hence salty dog. This is a sodium nickel battery. There's no dangerous earth, rare, no rare earth materials in this at all. There's no lithium, there's no cobalt. It is pure sodium and nickel. It's 100% recyclable, and it is safe, safe, safe. This is long lasting, but more than that, we've designed it for the people in this industry. Hence why it has not just for AC output plugs, it has XLRs as well, so you can run direct DC equipment. A little bit of a highlight reel. It is 100% recyclable, this unit. And that includes, man, this is a good crowd. I'm liking this. <laughs> you should come to my next presentation. <laughs> but the cell is 100% recyclable. As I said, it lasts a very long time as well. Because it's sodium nickel, this is a very old technology, which is just starting to get of attention, because lithium it's not just how bad it is, it's how expensive it's become, which then made people think there has to be a better way. And there's a better way, which is the greener way, which is to use sodium. You can recycle it 100%, but you have to wait a long time until you do, because this lasts a lot longer than standard lithium as well. After 4,500 cycles, that's using this unit every day. Every day. That's 12 and a half years. You're still going to have 80% of capacity of the actual unit left. This cell will last you 20 years. You can't get that out of lithium, not even lithium iron phosphate. So there are advantages to moving across the sodium, and they just keep on coming. As I said, safety. It's intrinsically safe, electromechanically safe. There is no thermal runway. 
We have set fire to this. We have pierced this. It does not explode. It does not catch fire. It keeps working. You lose a little bit of capacity, of course, but it keeps on going. So you can have this right next to you, and you will know that this big, big-ish, big-ish, it's not that big, we're getting bigger, but this big-ish power solution will not suddenly ignite and go. We've seen it happen, and when batteries go, it's terrible. So we've removed that problem as well. So it's not dangerous goods rated, so anybody can touch this. You can ship it by land, by sea, anyone can touch it. By air, you pack it as a class nine because it's bleeding their technology still, so we're getting there. IATA is coming around. It is portable, it is silent. If you actually want to have a wander over, that is on full blast, the fans, and I can't hear it, and this, you know, I'm getting old, but I think I could hear it still. So audio people are gonna love it, and it's gonna remove a bit of post-production going out as well. Because it's silent, you can move it right up against your light, so you're removing cabling, you're removing time, you're removing hassle, you get a more fluid set. And it comes with a five-year standard warranty. So we'll have a look at some of the specs. It is IP55 rated, so it can work out in the rain without a cover being added. So it makes it a bit more easy to use when it's being pushed around. Has a seven inch touchscreen display, which tracks all of the use of it. So you get your pure telemetrics out of this. So you can say from Monday to Wednesday, what did I output? It will tell you. You then use that to work out your CO2, your NOx, et cetera, which then you can put into all of your production details. 10 inch tires. It's being used in the real world. This isn't going up and down a corridor. You need big tires to make it quite nice and easy to move. And as I said, nine kilowatt hour capacity, 6,000 watts output, but that's guaranteed across the entire operating temperature range, which is minus 10 to plus 50. Now the cell can do a lot more, and we will keep on improving this until we can utilize the real power of this cell. In reality, the cell could do minus 40 to plus 70, but we are just trying to get something quick out that does the job better than anyone else, and then we're gonna keep on building upon this. It's like a Tesla one. You know what we're doing, we know what we're trying to show you where we're going with this, and then we're gonna really ramp it up and get it better. It comes with regional outputs, because you know not everyone's on 120 volts, the rest of the world's on 230. I wish you guys were, it makes my job easy. It has a Bates 50 amp connector, or in Europe, or a 230 system, it has a 32 amp C form connector. So you can run those big powerful lights still. So you, that will run, and I nearly gave it away because it's on a slide. These are some of the inputs. As I said, it's got solar PV, it's got level two EV, it's got PowerCon true one, and it can also charge up of standard mains. We've tried to make it flexible because you don't know where you're gonna be using this. You're not always going to be in the city, you could be on a production site. You could be anywhere, so we're trying to make it flexible. That's the pretty looking outputs. As I said, the stage one does change to a 32 amp C form. We all know what those ones are like. And that's a big, clean, real-time LCD screen, and there's lots of other steps behind it and other tables. So there's a lot of information, but what you really need to know is how long is it gonna hold up and how much is left. This will do it for you. We try to make it portable, because it is a bit of a unit at the end of the day. The more power you get into batteries, the more batteries you need, the heavier something it becomes. So it has hoist points, forklift, and wheel locks, which are designed to medical standards. What does that mean? We test it on a 10 degree angle, and if it holds, it passes medical standard. We do tip tests, and it's passed the medical standard as well. So we are trying to go one better than anybody else. It has to be safe, this technology, in every aspect. Now, I hinted at the lights. And this is really what it does. It's not just lights, of course. You have a variety of lights. You've got your video village, techno cranes. And you can see on there, there's a couple of HMIs. Now, the reason there's HMIs on there, I work quite closely with Ari. And they said to me, Andy, if you can do a HMI that can be powered by a battery, we'll be really happy. And I said, ah, oh, that's easy. I didn't know what I was talking about. I won't lie. It was Ari. I wasn't going to say no to them at the end of the day. And then they said, make it an M40. I said, you've got it. And actually, it does. So it will power an Ari M40 on full power for over one and a half hours. It doesn't sound like a long time, but if you're on a film set and you need to get that shot in the bag and you don't have time to run that generator line down, this will do the job. So it does give that flexibility and speed of use. There are obviously a couple of versions, 120 for North Americas, then we've got 230s over in Europe. I don't even remember this bit. <laughs> 
It, it wasn't this slow before. <laughs> but they're the prices. We don't hide behind it. You know, the US one is $42,500, but it lasts for 20 years. You, we can do something cheaper, we can do something easier, but there's no point. We're all here to make a difference, and to make a difference, it does cost a bit more up front, but you're going to get more than that back. You won't have that fuel. You won't have that maintenance person. There's so many savings that aren't seen in pot A that we see coming out of pot C. What we have to do is get both of these pots together and go, upfront cost is this, but when you spread that over 20 years, this is the reality. It's not easy to get there because it's the hardest thing in the world to get there, but I can see on the faces out here, we all want to get there. This is the first step, so bear with me. There's more to come. Thank you for your time. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, if you're as curious as I am, you've got about 20 minutes left now to go and uh, play with Andy in this corner uh, with the salty dog, as well as with uh, William F. White. There's also uh, Mike Harwood there, who's there to talk about the various pieces of equipment that William F. White have on offer. And you, finally, there's uh, also about 20 minutes left for anyone that's interested in doing an EV test drive. Please head over to the Driving Force uh, desk over here and enjoy the clean tech that we have here for you today. <laughs> 